module. Right, so until now, we have been using R clone on the command line. Uh, you can certainly interact with Acacia using the command line on Pawsey systems. How are, however, there are more powerful ways to integrate object storage into your HPC workflows. Since the time limit for files on Scratch is 21 days, object storage on Acacia is one, one of the primary means for warm tier data storage at Pawsey. So Banks here is for long-term storage, but uh, Acacia is for warm tier. So that's um, storage that um, that is longer than 21 days, but um, not as long as um, what you would need. Uh, sorry, not as it's for data that you would need a bit more frequently than what you could fetch from Banksia. Okay, so in this tutorial, we're going to look at using the Unix utility tar or tape archive to create, examine, compress, and extract files in archive format. Then we're going to be using tar and rclone together. So it turns out that you can pipe, you can pipe um, tar files straight to Acacia. So you can stream tar files straight to Acacia, uh, which is really good, which kind of bypasses the whole tar and then upload step. But, um, but with the streaming approach, uh, you might have um, some data, you know, it, it might not be as, um, the integrity of the copies. Um, if you're absolutely, you know, if you absolutely need um, data copied with integrity, you, you use the checksum method. But if you need something to dump directories to Acacia, then a tar method could be a solution for you. So let's get on to the Pawsey system. We've already got our our mock data. And now we're just going to do a mini tutorial on tar. And so when uh, when Lachlan arrives, uh, we'll pause we'll pause um, we'll pause this tutorial so that we can we can get those um, get those questions sorted out. But uh, so I'll keep going with tar until and un until Lachlan until Lachlan arrives. Okay, so tape. Archive or tar is a Unix utility to sequentially aggregate many files and directories into one file. So tar's intended purpose was to concatenate files ready for being written to tape. So that was its original purpose. But the file format now serves as like a general archive format that supports POSIX file metadata. So a tar file may be compressed on creation and tar supports compression using a number of different compressors, namely gzip and bzip2. So there's some of the compressors that are available for tar. So when is when to use tar? It might be useful to integrate tar into your workflow under the following circumstances. Uh, one of them is when there are so many files that their storage in Acacia will exceed the desired limit or the nominal limit of 100,000 objects per bucket. So if you think you're going to go over that limit, then it is a good idea to use tar files. Now, remember, so, so remember with each, with each synchronization, so when you're synchronizing files to Acacia, every file is a unique um, setup and teardown of a, um, a HTTPS connection. So uh, there's overheads associated with that. When there, in those cases, there is a performance benefit in aggregating a large number of small files. So each upload to Acacia is its own connection, and that takes time to set up and tear down. Uh, tar is good when you don't need individual access to files. So if you can just download a tar file and then look within that tar file for what you need, um, that is okay. 
When you need to preserve things like empty directories, uh, the tar archive is good for that as well. Because if you try and upload an empty directory to Acacia, it won't work. An empty directory, um, an empty directory cannot be represented by an object. So, uh, yeah. So that is um, so. Tape archive files are good when you need to preserve empty directories. So when to use compression? So tar files can be compressed, but this is really only a benefit when compression is effective. So for many types of binary data, the space saved through compression is often marginal. And that's because with many types of binary data, there's no real patterns there in that data that a compressor can exploit. So that is why um, that is why the space saved through compression is often marginal. So how do we create archives? So the basic syntax is tar cf, and then the name of your tar file, and then the things to include. So the c uh, option means create, and the f means that we're going to be using a file as the output for tar. OK, so let's go ahead and create a tar file from the simulation directory. So we're just doing tar cf simulation.tar. And I need to change directory to the data directory in order to do this. So we'll do tar cf simulation.tar. And that has tarred all the, all the files um, in the simulation directory. So to include everything in the current directory, including hidden files, so um, you could uh, also do this. So usually uh, it's better to put the tar file somewhere else other than the directory that is being archived. After, otherwise, you'll get a warning about the tar file trying to include itself in the archive. Um, sometimes you'd like to see extra verbosity when you create tar files. So adding the V flag, um, adding the V flag is useful. So we're going to create a tar file and we're going to add in the V flag. So that shows you everything that was included in the tape archive file. Now you can compress at the same time. You can compress at the same time as you create the tar file. And you can do that with the Z or J flag, but not both. So that switches on, the Z or J flag switches on compression. So the J flag corresponds to BZIP2 compression, and the resulting file is usually given a .tar.bz2 extension. OK, the flag Z is for gzip compression, and the output file is usually given the extension .tar.gz. So normally bzip2 achieves a better compression ratio than gzip, but it is slower. So we're going to create a gzip compressed tape archive with this command. So I'm just going to run that. So that creates a um, a gzip a gzip version or a gzip to take archive, and if I do the tar jcf, um, we will create a bzip two um, a bzip two compressed tar file. So we can try timing the archive creation using these two compression options. Uh, which took which process took the longest? So how many times longer did it take than uncompressed? Um, which process achieved the um, the smallest file size? Um, Hannah's I oh, sorry, Hannah, I don't know if we're going to lose I think we usually lose access to the accounts. Um, we usually lose access to the accounts straight after 
the course is finished. Um, but uh, do do you have access to Pawsey? I uh, no, I don't have access to Pawsey. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. I um, think just, so. Toby, I think uh, the accounts should work until, until about 5 p.m. Uh, per time. Right. Today. Okay. Yes. That's fantastic. Thanks, Fatima. So we have about 5 p.m. Um, AWST uh, before the accounts go offline. All right. Thank you. No worries. Surely there must be some kind of quasi NCI detente where we can <laughs> we we can grant Hannah's a small account. <laughs> I'll survive. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's time let's time the creation of our our tar files. So, all right. So I'm just going to time the creation of just a straight tar creation. So we'll do that. And we took um, 0 0.433 uh, seconds of real real time. But let's try now with the gzip version. So we'll try creating that tar file and compressing it at the same time. So we've taken slightly longer than just our basic tar. So we've taken slightly longer to use gzip. But if we use bzip, so let's try let's try bzip. Um, we've taken a lot longer, so we've taken about five times as long um, to use bzip. Um, so B, bzip um, bzip achieves a greater compression ratio, but it also takes longer. And I mean, there are other compressors for tar. There are lots of other compressors that you can use, and each of them will have a trade-off between speed and compression ratio. So I'll I'll just uh, make those tar files again, but I'll use the J flag um, tar dot bz two. So I've um, I've taken more than two seconds to do the bzip2 compression. But if we have a look at the file size for simulation.tar, it's 107 meg. But if we have a look at the file size of the gzip, we've got 160 kilobytes. And if we have a look at the, um, the bzip2, um, we've got 12 kilobytes. So bzip2 has exploited the pattern of zeros <laughs> that is in these these files. Uh, Michael says, hit up the preparatory access scheme for general access. Yep, yep. So you can get uh, general access to uh, to Pawsey that way. Yeah. So bzip2 in this instance has done a better job at finding the, the zeros in the data, uh, but it's taken a lot longer to do that. So when you're when you're using tar and compression, there's going to be a trade-off between speed and compression ratio. Um, these compression ratios are extraordinary though, because the data is full of zeros. So you will not with real data, you won't achieve anywhere near these compression ratios um, unless your data is um, has repeating patterns in it. There is a way, there is a way to do compression in parallel. Um, so you can do the compression in parallel. Oh, um, if if Lachlan arrives too, um, don't hesitate to um, to shout out as well, just because I, I can't see the all the participants. So yeah, so if Lachlan arrives, just um, yep. just let me know. I'll keep an eye. I'll keep <laughs> yeah. an eye, Toby. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Okay, so we can use a com a parallel compressor. There's a parallel compressor called PigZ, or parallel implementation of gzip. So that can use multiple cores. So um, the tar compression that we saw just used one core, I believe, or one thread. 
So uh, PIGZ, parallel implementation of GZIP, and we can use that program to compress and decompress um, things in uh, in parallel. Okay, so um, we've got that. So if we use the uh, if we timed the compression of that that same tar.gz file, if we timed that process, see how the time is a lot less than what the single core implementation took. Um, so using pigz is as part of your tarring and untarring process is um, is really good. In fact. In fact, using pigz has taken even less time, even less time than the tar file creation. I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, the tar file creation took 0.433 seconds, but using pigz has taken the time taken down to 0.15. So yeah, so using pigz is a game changer when it comes to tar performance. So we can use we can use PigZ to uh, compress and uncompress data. Uh, it looks like so I'll try I'll try using using it to uncompress. Okay, so we've um, we've uncompressed the data there. So. With tar archives, uh, files can be left out of the archive using one or more exclude flags. So if we tried, if we tried making the um, the file again, if we tried making the file again, um, we can exclude, for example, all the dat files by having this exclude flag. So it's similar to the R clone exclude flag where we can exclude based on certain characteristics. I don't know if this is regex. It could possibly be. Lift, listing the archive contents. So if we use the T flag or the list flag, um, that shows what is in an archive. So if I go um, tar tf, uh, simulation.tar, that shows me what files are in the archive. And you can do this, so you can do this on a compressed archive. So you can even list the contents of a compressed archive. Um, doing this. So if I do tar tjf, so that um, that allows us to list the contents of um, of our compressed tape archive. So there's even a rudimentary search facility using wildcards. So we can look for certain files inside our archive using tar tf um, with wildcards, and then our I'm just going to say regex, but um, our star.log. So that will search for anything um, with that pattern inside the tape archive. So if I go if I go tar tf simulation.tar with wildcards um, data zero star.log, we can only list uh, files with those characteristics. Okay, so extracting archives, we use the tar x via, so the x stands for extract, and that will dump the contents of our tar file uh, to the current directory. So we'll do that. Okay, so you can extract the contents of the tar archive to another directory. So let's go mkdir uh, simulation3 and Let's do. Let's extract the tar file to the simulation three directory. So if I have a look at um, the simulation three directory, 
it has um, extracted the simulation directory to the simulation three directory. So it's it's dumped the entire contents of the tape archive, including the simulation directory, and put it into simulation three. So you can set a directory as the output of a tape archive extract. So how do we extract um, how do we extract compressed archives? We do um, we do a tar xjvf so tar xjvf simulation.tar.bz2 and that extracts everything in here. Um, we can add files to an archive. So if we if we copy our simulation directory to simulation two. So I'm copying the simulation and we can we can add we can add things using the R flag. So R is append. We can use append or R and that will add things to an existing archive. But this only works for normal tape archives. It doesn't work for compressed archives. So you can't add things to compressed archives. So compressed tar files cannot be updated. But you can you can update um, you can update normal tar archives. So that's the trade-off that you have by using compressed tar files, is that you might not be able to add, or you can't add things to them, to compressed tar archives. You can only add things to normal tar archives. Okay, you can delete things from a tape archive. So I've just done um, a tar delete. Um, a tar with a delete flag, and that has removed the simulation to directory. So there's no simulation to directory inside. Um, you can compare files in an archive using the compare flag. So what I've done here is I have deleted a file in the tape archive, and then I have created an additional file um, at the end. And we can use this tar compare option to compare to see if there are any differences between the local file system and what's in the tar archive. So sometimes it can be problematic and or slow to create an intermediate tar file. So on palsy systems, um, it is possible to stream the output from tar directly to Acacia using the rclone rcat command. So I wouldn't recommend doing this for extremely large or mission critical transfers, um, nor would I recommend this method for transferring data to Acacia outside of Pawsey. For those sorts of transactions, you really need the checksum checksumming copies that are available in our clone. So um, yeah, so use this method, use this method with a bit of caution. So um, tar can take standard input or standard output as the source or the destination. You just have to have a hyphen instead of a file name. So I've got a single hyphen there as um, as the uh, file name. And so what we're doing here is I'm tarring, I'm using tar to create um, a, to create a tar file on the fly and I am streaming it to R clone using the R clone Rcat command. And so that creates a tar file on the fly and then streams it directly to Acacia. So I'll paste that. Um, I need to create my bucket name. Export bucket name is equal to, uh, sorry, uh, our clone LSF Acacia Mine. Sorry, I've forgotten my bucket name. There it is. So that's our 
That's our bucket name. Export bucket name is equal to that. Okay, so what I'm done, what I've done there is on the fly, I have created a tar archive and I have streamed it directly to Acacia, bypassing the bypassing the intermediary intermediary tape archive. So this is um, this is a uh, yeah fairly fairly good technique that um, that enables you to um, to bypass the intermediary tar file. So you can use pigz with this process as well. So we're using tar cf, the simulation directory, use compressed program is equal to pigz, and then we pipe that to our clone rcat. And then that streams a compressed, um, streams a compressed, sorry, streams a directory, compresses it, and streams it to Acacia all in one go. So you can imagine using a combination of these commands, it's actually quite powerful now um, to quickly blast directories up to um, up to tar archives on Acacia. Uh, when you're using these streaming commands with Acacia, I think you remove the progress flag. Um, otherwise, that will dump things to standard um, output, which you do not want to have in your tape archive. Okay, so you can stream files from the archive. So here we go. When streaming files from Acacia through tar, you can use the cat command instead of rcat. So I'm using um, rclone cat to stream the tape archive um, through to, um, yep, through tar and then out to the current directory. And I can also, or I can also do um, the pigz uh, compression version of that. So if I go to um, simulation two, um, I'm going to, I'm going to stream that uh, tar archive out of Acacia, uncompress it on the fly, um, uncompress it on the fly, and um, and put the result into simulation two. So that's um, that's some commands that are in that in that teaching module or training module that uh, are helpful. So while streaming to and from an S3 backend such as Acacia, all transfers are chunked with a hard limit of this is a hard coded limit of ten thousand chunks. I don't know why um, it's 10,000 chunks, but there is some programming history or development history in there. So by default, for our clone, each chunk size is 5 mebibytes. So that gives a maximum transfer file size of just under 50 um, gig gigabytes. <laughs> so, um, so you can increase the chunk size for our clone by adding this line. So if we if we um, edit our dot config uh, dot config our clone our clone dot conf, if we just add this extra option here, chunk size is equal to one g. Um, so that that increases the chunk size of our uploads to one gigabyte. Um, and that increases the maximum allowed file size on Acacia to just under 10 tebibytes. So please note there are no integrity checks with tar-based streaming methods. Um, if you want something mission critical, I would suggest instead using our clone copy or our clone sync uh, with those caveats um, with option n transfers is equal to n. Um, 